Welcome to our first, the Scott Institute for Energy Innovation, our first lecture series. Uh, this is the first of a, a number of different entrepreneurial uh, themed lectures that are going to be kicked off by Reed here. I'll introduce him in a moment, but we're so glad you're here. Just by a show of hands, I'm curious of, the, we tried our best to get kind of a campus-wide makeup of students uh, outside of just this building. Who here is from the Mellon College of Science? The Tepper School of Business. Okay, okay. good. College of Engineering? Hines? Okay, all right, you got a good mix. We're doing better than we did last year. So thanks for being here, thanks for coming to Hungary. Um, I'm just gonna get a quick, quick little intro of the Scott Institute so you know what we have to offer uh, in the future. So uh, we're kind of the campus-wide uh, hub on campus looking at uh, all things energy. So we have uh, over 160 different faculty affiliates from all across from the colleges that you uh, raised your hands for. Uh, campus as energy is a very interdisciplinary challenge. Um, we do this through uh, collaborative research, strategic partnerships, policy outreach, entrepreneurship, and education. We give out seed funding every year to grow new uh, clean energy research. We provide support for new energy research initiatives, so forming new teams across campus, making sure that people are finding ways to collaborate in ways that they weren't able to before. We provide, en uh, uh, we provide energy for energy startups. Uh, we also host many energy-themed events, such as this one, to hope, uh, we hope to inspire and uh, uh, create a sense of community around these challenges. So at the end of the day, our mission really is to encourage the development of breakthrough technologies and policies that help accelerate us to uh, a sustainable, low-carbon energy future. Uh, I forgot to mention, my name is Daniel Tachik. Uh, <laughs> I'm the executive director of the Scott Institute, and uh, again, we're just so happy to have you got all here. So if you want to stay in touch for more talks like this, uh, more opportunities for free food, always a good perk, uh, sign up for our newsletter here. Feel free to uh, scan this QR code. You can sign up. Each month, if you're ever curious of what's happening related to energy across the entire university, we do our best to put that into one monthly newsletter, and uh, that'll show up straight into your inbox. Some other ways to stay in touch, uh, feel free to email uh, the Scott Institute at andrew.cmu.edu. That'll go to myself or someone on our staff to answer any questions you may have. We're on LinkedIn, we're on Twitter or X, or whatever it's called these days, and uh, that there is our website. <coughs> So just a quick uh, summary of some upcoming events. So we have Olivia Dippo. She is an alum. She uh, got her degree in material science and engineering just down the hall uh, back in 2015. And she's the co-founder and CEO of Limelight Steel. They are making uh, low carbon emissions uh, iron and steel making. So she's coming next Thursday. We'll be in this exact room uh, with free food. Uh, Later uh, next month, we're going to have uh, Christina Chang from Lower Carbon. She's a partner there. She's going to be coming to talk about basically uh, similar things to read, but sort of a, a more national, global scope in terms of how do we take stuff from the lab and actually turn it into a business. Uh, so lab to climate venture, solving problems that matter with Christina Chang. And then at the end of October, we have a distinguished lecture with Brian Anderson, formerly the director of the National Energy Technology Laboratory, now the executive director of the Interagency Working Group on Coal and Power Plant Communities and Economic Revitalization, and also got a promotion as senior advisor on uh, energy communities at the DOE. That is on October uh, 26th at 12 in this room as well. And then lastly, uh, we don't have anything to sign up for specifically here, but this coming February, uh, the Scott Institute, we will be uh, hosting the regional finals for Energy Tech University Prize. Uh, if you're not familiar, it's basically, it's a collegiate competition uh, challenging student teams to uh, present their best business plan. You don't have to have an actual business, an actual startup to compete in this. You just need to have a plan. And, uh, and uh, the, the winners of that competition go on to a national competition and there's uh, over $250,000 in cash prizes. So, we will be uh, hosting the regional finals in February, so please uh, keep in touch, sign up for our newsletter, and you can see information about how to sign up for that. So, enough of that. Uh, I would love to introduce our esteemed speaker today. So, Reed McManical, he's a uh, mentor in residence in CMU's Center for Technology Transfer and Enterprise Creation. We just relocated to Bakery Square, I just learned. 
Uh, he advises researchers at CMU in protection of their intellectual property and in development of strategies to move their work to commercial use. He's been doing this for over 30 years, uh, managing academic IP and in assisting uh, the formation and early funding of technology-based startup companies. He's been at CMU since 2006, so for 14 years. Uh, now focuses his efforts on assisting with the formation and growth of startup companies around the university, uh, inventions, and from all departments. So again, it's really thrill thrilling to see so many people from all across campus and all departments uh, who could interact with Reed. So prior to coming here, he was a, a licensing officer for the University of Pittsburgh's Office of Technology Management. And while he was there, he basically wrote the university's policy on startup companies uh, and did many, many other great things there. Uh, he received a BA in political science and economics from the University of Dayton, go Flyers, you do. Uh, and a JD from the University of Pennsylvania and an MBA from CMU. So with that, I would love to have Reed give his talk. All right. <clears throat> Daniel, thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's great to see you all. Um, I want to follow up on Daniel's question of what schools you're from. Ask how many of you are undergraduates? A few. How many of you are master's students? How many of you are PhD students? All right. That helps me think about what I'm going to say and how I'm going to say it. You might need I need to, to turn this. Start. It's not showing up on the screen. All right. I also need to turn this thing on. There we go. There we go. Go ahead and restart it. It's up. OK, cool. All righty. So um, as Daniel said, I've been working in technology transfer, technology protection, technology commercialization, startup funding, and so on in Pittsburgh since the mid-'80s. So if you can imagine what Pittsburgh was like in the mid-'80s, basically everybody was moving away. I moved in, land of opportunity. I've been here ever since, working in the technology field. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is alternative career paths for students. So when you're, you're thinking about your, your career as a student, especially if you're a, a PhD student, a lot of people at CMU doing PhDs are thinking, I'm going to go and be an academic. Like, this is my ticket. I'm going to become a professor someplace. <clears throat> and the route there is you do a postdoc and then you, you apply for jobs all over the world and you end up getting uh, starting on a teaching position. Maybe it's a research track and so on. Maybe you get into tenure track. It's this whole process. The other traditional um, route is to go work for companies and typically a large company, not a startup. So these are sort of the traditional routes regardless of you know, what de degree you're pursuing. And the, the placement office of the universities are really set up to help you find those large company jobs. So they do you know, job fairs and things like that. They have the handshake program. But it's not really easy or obvious if you're interested in working for or starting a, a startup company how to do that. So that's what this presentation is about. I just remembered I want to introduce my colleague from the tech transfer office, Jake Greenberg. He's one of our licensing managers. Uh, the way the tech transfer office is organized if we, is we have a bunch of licensing managers, each of whom are managing inventions as they come in the door, evaluating them, filing patents, eventually hoping to negotiate a license to get the technology out of the university where it can be used commercially. The licensing managers some, are somewhat siloed. So this person works just with robotics. This person just works with MC, Mellon College of Science. This person just works with engineering and so on. Jake works primarily in the School of Engineering. So all of you had your hand up, say I'm working, you're in the School of Engineering, Jake's your guy. <clears throat> Anyways, that segue. So I'm going to talk about um, how to get connected in to existing startup early stage companies, which may or may not go through the handshake process or be at a career fair or things like that. And then what are the, the resources on campus to help you if you do want to form a startup company around your, your research work, for example? <clears throat> um, so uh, for finding opportunities in existing small companies, there's some resources in-house and there's some resources out in the, the larger community. My, my comments are focused primarily on Pittsburgh, but you're going to find similar kind of things in, in other regions. So within CMU, um, handshake, 
is used by the large corporations, but also when the small companies, startups reach out to us and say, hey, how can I recruit your students? We say, go to Handshake. So I'm assuming you're all familiar with that. Um, another thing that we tell companies is sponsor a project course, sponsor a capstone course. If you want to interact with the students and find out what they're capable of doing, this is a good way to test the waters with them. So all of you have opportunities to take capstone courses. You get to choose which projects to work on. Pick the ones with the type of company that you want to work with. And part of my role in, in tech transfer is being sort of a facilitator broker to line up startup companies to participate in project courses at CMU. So this semester, there are going to be four projects in the ETIM program that are from our startup list. Um, we have six now pending with the MBA program over at uh, Pitts Business School. Um, they have a fall entrepreneurship class that's been working on projects for us for a number of years. I've had project courses with Tepper students, had project courses even with University of Chicago, Ohio State, um, University of California, Berkeley. So whenever I find a connection that says, hey, do you have a project for us to work on? It's like, oh, yes, I do, and try to make those connections. Um, I'm going to mention this multiple times. Your homework going out of here is sign up for the Schwartz Center Weekly Bulletin. So it will tell you job opportunities, but also this company just raised $10 million, a CMU-affiliated company, or this company is coming to present on campus, or here's this pitch competition that you could uh, participate in and so on. Sign up for the weekly bulletin. I'm going to say that probably three or four more times. That's your homework. Um, and then um, CMU collaborating with Pitt. During this Global Entrepreneurship Week, we'll have a startup job fair where we sort of source companies come out, coming out of Pitt and CMU who are interested in finding people like you to work in the companies. Um, outside CMU, <clears throat> there's a local economic development organization called Innovation Works. If you have any interest in startups, you need to know about Innovation Works. So they have this job board, but they also have four different accelerator programs. If you're interested in forming a startup, they have a software accelerator program. They have a hardware accelerator program. They have a robotics accelerator program. They have a health tech accelerator program. And all of those sort of feed into their investment programs, their job boards, and things like that. But typically, the starting point for an early startup is to go into one of their accelerator programs. Companies that are already in those programs are posting jobs on their job board. Innovation Works is one of the most active early stage investors in the country. And they're investing just in southwestern Pennsylvania. So their portfolio of companies is often ones that came out of CMU, went through our internal support programs, then got into Innovation Works, and then went from there further downstream into maybe venture capital or angels or something. Uh, the Pittsburgh Technology Council is a consortium trade association of technology companies in Pittsburgh. It's been around since the, the early 1980s. They have a career page on their website. The other big piece of advice besides signing up for the weekly bulletin is get out of the university and go into the community and network. There's events going on all of the time. I get asked like every week, like, hey, will you promote this event for life sciences startups or energy startups or material science startups or so on? There's things going on all the time. I will forward all of them to the weekly bulletin people. They will put in a weekly bulletin so I don't have to remember who all to invite. Um, Pittsburgh Business Times, Pittsburgh Inno is an um, online version um, just around technology, technically, PGH, Next Pittsburgh, all of these things um, are newsletters or trade associations or so on that have information about what's going on. and. Um, some of them, like Pittsburgh Robotics Network, has um, periodic events where there's hundreds of people in the robotics area get together once. Rust Built has a newsletter. Anyways, all that sort of outside um, CMU and inside CMU for connecting to existing companies, in a sense. Now I'm going to talk about what if you want to form your own startup company? What, how can you get help here? So I'm going to talk about this combination of organizations. CTEC is where Jake and I are, the Center for Technology Transfer and Enterprise Creation. Our mission is to manage the university's inventions and to help move those out to where they can benefit society. 
when I say university's inventions, I have a specific meaning to that based on our IP policy. CMU's IP policy says CMU owns inventions when those inventions came out of funded research. So if you're a PhD student, you're probably paid on a federal research grant. Similarly with a faculty member, your IP in those situations is owned by CMU. In all other situations, you own the IP personally. So if you're a master's student, you're undergraduate student, you're not being paid on a research grant, you own your own IP. So you're not part of um, uh, our area of responsibility within the university. The Schwartz Center, on the other hand, is agnostic to IP ownership. So they work with everybody. So maybe two thirds of their portfolio is undergraduate students, master's students, and even alums. So any sort of connection to CMU, you work with the Schwartz Center. If it's CMU owned IP, you work with CTEC, and we sort of overlap on the ones that are they're jointly owned, or owned by the university. So um, this is a sort of bragging slide to give you a sense of the scale of operations of startups coming out of CMU. I haven't updated this in a couple years because our numbers weren't great during COVID and I didn't feel like it and I've been busy and blah, blah, blah. I got lots of excuses. But in this, in this 10 year time period from 2010 to 2019, over 300 startups were formed at CMU. And the sub bullet there breaks that out between the ones based on university IP, the CTEC ones, and the ones not based on CMU IP. So the undergraduates, master students, and alums that work with the Short Center typically. If you look at the next line, how much money was raised, over $2 billion, the numbers are reversed. So a smaller number based on IP raised twice as much money. And that's because those are the deep tech things. So they're the more significant, more impactful kind of things coming out of some research pedigree. And often they need more money to get to market. You know, developing a material science technology versus something that you came up with in a, in a project course is a different scale of potential impact and required funding. Um, we've had um, some great successes in a sense, a bunch of exits. Um, you're probably all familiar with Duolingo. Not everybody knows that Duolingo came out of CMU, but it did. Um, and we've had, in the last couple of years, three companies go public through uh, reverse mergers. So Another thing I like to brag about CMU when I, I talk to peers in other universities or to investors or entrepreneurs or whatever, like we have startups coming out of every nook and cranny of CMU. So if we look at this kind of chart from other universities, there'd be like four departments maybe that would be where all our startups are coming from. And this chart is just the ones based on CMU owned IP, but it, they're from everywhere. So we have two software startups that came out of the art department. Like, who even does software and art? Come on. So they're coming out of everywhere, mostly engineering, um, robotics, but also chemistry, biology, and so on. So when investors come and talk to us, almost always they come in with the lens of like, CMU's really good at artificial intelligence and robotics. We say, well, yeah, that's true, but we're also good at energy. We're good at materials. We're good at chemistry. We're good at biology. We have a lot of different things that we aren't necessarily well known for. <clears throat> so when we think about doing a startup, like one of the first issues is like, why would we do that? You know, we meeting, say you as a student or the faculty member or so on, like you're super busy and coming out of CMU, you're gonna have really nice career options and doing a startup, probably isn't the easiest thing that you could do. Like, why, why go through that? So the first bullet here is sort of focused on like faculty members. Like, what kind of impact do you want to have in your career? Do you want to train a bunch of students, have them get out of here? You want to have great publications and highly ranked periodicals? Like, you want to get awards? Or do you want to see the results of your research like actually out there and impacting society in some way? And publishing it in a paper probably isn't going to accomplish that latter goal. You actually need to like do the hard work of turning some research result into a product and get it out being sold to people to have that kind of impact. You can come up with a great new battery technology invention and prove it in your lab. It's a hundred times better. But if 
that's the end of it. You publish your paper and somebody gets their PhD, doesn't go anywhere. So if you want to have that kind of impact, often you need to figure out a way to get it out into the commercial world. And often the commercial world isn't interested at the stage that it's at in the university. So the, the end, we're, I'll come back to that point. But anyways, so another um, rationale, uh, motivation for do, doing this is, you know, if you're lucky, things go well, you can actually make some money out. So um, uh, Luis Fonon, faculty member who started Duolingo, you know, they, they did a IPO. The company's worth, you know, multiple billions of dollars. He's worth a lot of money now because he did a startup based on his research. I'm not saying that happens in every case, and it's um, actually fairly rare to do well, uh, but there are other ways of doing well that I'll talk about. Um, so another is um, just, it's another way of thinking. It's another skill set to have. And, you know, faculty members often are very curious and like, when, I, when I'm interacting with them, they're brilliant in their field, best in their field. But like over here, like, I don't know anything about business. So this is kind of fascinating. I'm liking learning about it. So there's motivation for that. And an alternative career path for students. So that's sort of the theme of this, this program is rather than going to the large company or um, going into academia, working for a startup is sort of a different path on your career that can have these other kind of awards, but also set you up for different kind of life experience. And I'm going to have a couple examples later of students who've like created startup companies and how their career went and so on. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, so this isn't easy. And part of the reason it's not easy in the domain that I deal with, with faculty and PhD students, is there's not necessarily an entrepreneur in the room when we're having the first conversation. If you're master's students or undergraduates and you have a, an idea, like you're the one who's going to run with that. If it's a faculty member, they're not going to give up their day job, typically. Occasionally, Louis Von on did. Uh, but typically, they're not going to. The PhD student may say, I have a great job offer at Google. Like, I'm not going to do this startup. Or like, I have kids. Like, I can't take this risk. So, or uh, the, the complications of visa issues, like, I just can't. I'm not gonna. So we've had, I've been at CMU for a long time. I've seen so many things, just brilliant results in their lab, sitting on the shelf because there's nobody to run with it. So some of the programs that we have are like trying to address that and make it easier for the people involved. <clears throat> um, the other challenge, um, these next two are sort of related, is like university research is not directed at product development. If you're working for a company, they're going to have a, a vision of the product roadmap. Like, here's where we're at. We want a 10% improvement in this by next year and so on. And they know all the competition. And they know, like, it's really clear what to work on. In universities, it's like, oh, this is an interesting research problem. Wouldn't it be interesting to learn about this? It's not directed towards making a product. And then when it's done, it's, even if it was on a path towards being a product, maybe a battery or something, like, it's a lab result. Like I've proved that at this kind of scale, like no customer is going to buy something that you proved in a lab at that scale. So how do you get beyond these kind of things is why I have a job by helping um, get over this valley of death. And often this is referred to as multiple valleys of death. <clears throat> the, the, the line here is showing like funding. You know, so. In an academic situation, you're starting off, you know, typically with federal research grants. Money's coming in, pays for basic research. And then as you start getting into applied research, the federal grants say, this is too applied. We can't fund it out of NSF or DOD. It's too applied. You have to go find new sources. And then you have to get beyond that laboratory result to some sort of prototype. And like you have to maybe scale up and you have to hire people. Like, where's all that money come from? So you're like, using other people's money before you eventually get to a point where you have some revenues and money coming in. So that's where investors come in, uh, small business research grants, angel investors, corporate partners, and so on. <clears throat> so this slide is intended to talk about some of the challenges in doing startups as well as some of the resources that CMU provides. 
I'm not going to go into a lot of depth on the resources because I have subsequent slides on every one of these. But the idea here is our starting point is typically when you're in a university, you don't have a lot of business skills. Maybe some of you worked in industry before coming to university, um, but often the faculty members haven't, often PhD students haven't. Um, so we approach this in a couple different ways. There's a whole list of things here that can be broadly categorized into help increase your skills or partner you with somebody else that has skills. And I'll come back to those things. The second column is about finding product market fit. And this is the idea of you have a technology or a business idea that can be used maybe for many different things, but you're not really sure what the best use case is. So we have various programs that work with you to go out and talk to customers so that you understand the problem from their perspective instead of saying, hey, I have a technology, do you want to buy it? Like make sure you understand what their problem is, solve the problem, own the problem, understand the problem, the technology in a sense doesn't matter. Own the problem. So we'll talk about that. Access to funding, I sort of alluded on the previous slide how challenging it is to scrape together bits and pieces of money. So we have various programs in the university and there's other things outside. And then when you're setting up a company, like where's this company gonna be? We have different resources for that. So this sort of thematically will categorize many of the other things I'm gonna talk about later. <clears throat> but first, here's some, some stories. So this guy was sitting in your seat less than 10 years ago. Now he's a billionaire. And I'm not exaggerating. He, he started this company making um, electrified powertrains for semi-trucks, um, went public uh, through a reverse merger, SPAC kind of thing. Um, I'm not sure the number. I think the company's worth like seven billion or something. So he's worth a billion. Um, he's on CME's board of trustees. Maybe he's 31. So, but some of his early activities, he participated in um, Project Olympus. He was in this national rice business plan competition. <clears throat> so less than 10 years ago, he was sitting where you are. Um, this guy was in EPP, got a PhD. He founded this company. Um, it was acquired uh, five years later. This was not like a huge financial success for him, um, but it, gave him the kind of credibility in the acquiring company uh, where he moved in from like a guy out of a PhD program, started this company, had like three or four employees. He became like the chief technology officer, chief innovation officer of the larger company because they so valued his entrepreneurial experience. He wasn't somebody who had been toiling away in a lab for, for five years. He'd been out there hustling, trying to figure out how to bring something to market even the big companies place real value on that. So there's multiple stories like that of people I've worked with over the years where they started something. It wasn't a huge success, but it, it allowed them to move up into senior management at a young age where before, other than that, they probably would still be in a lab kind of position. So I'm not intending that you can read this. It's one of like a bunch of slides I'm gonna run through in a hurry here. Um, the point of this is that the, the leftmost column here is startups or projects that were trying to become startups, and then the range of different assistance programs that were available to them and when they took advantage of them. So I'm not expecting you to read this. I just want you to look at like both the, the breadth of possible programs and the length of the list here. And these are all just in the energy and clean tech, climate tech um, space. So, page one, page two, page three, page four, and so on. Like all of those are energy related coming out of CMU. These are not just CMU owned IP. Some of these are student IPs, but if you wanna start an energy company, there's a lot of people before you who've done this and are now many of them available to be advisors or mentors to you as you go down this path. So, um, I earlier talked about the, the columns and um, the challenges. One of them is limited business skills. Approach one, increase your skills. Approach two, connect you to outside people. <coughs> um, so many of the programs I'm gonna talk about later are sort of under the approach one. And 
Many of these are under the Schwartz Center, and some of them we helped to run from our position within CTEC. And then access to outside entrepreneurs. Um, I joke that I run a dating service between entrepreneurs and scientists. So I have a somewhat steady stream of people coming in saying, hey, I'm looking for my next opportunity. I just exited my last company. I'm looking for something in this space. What do you have? And I pull out the magic list and say, look through the list, narrow it down, let's talk, and I'll tell you the backstory, and then we can decide which ones you want to connect to. And then I make the introductions, and sometimes I'm holding hand as I go through the dating process, and other times they're just on their own. Um, but that's... Another thing that we do to try to get over this thing. So as I'm starting to get down into individual programs now, um, I first want to call attention to this entrepreneur boot camp. It happens every year at the beginning of the fall semester where the Schwartz Center says, hey, everybody, welcome back to CMU or welcome to CMU. Come and learn about all of our different programs. So it's, it's sort of what I'm doing here today, but more focused from the, the Schwartz Center, and they'll have a panel of like, students who've done startups in the past and students who are doing startups now and so on. So it's a great way to like get tapped into the larger entrepreneurial community at CMU. It's this Saturday. I'll see you there. Um, don't forget to register while you're doing the registering for the weekly bulletin. Same website. All right, so um, another way that we work on improving your skills is through a series of workshops called Connects Workshops. And they cover many different startup topics, like how to evaluate whether your product is a good idea or not, like how to pick a lawyer, um, you know, how to start a company on a student visa, just dozens and dozens of topics. And then some of them are legal um, subject matter that we do in collaboration with uh, Pitt's Law School. And some of them are sort of case study kind of things where you come in with your situation and a team of law students is assigned to work with you, say, on should we be an LLC or a C Corp? Or like, how do we do this kind of contract? Whatever. So in addition to these things coming up throughout this fall and spring semesters, there's a huge archive on, on the website where you don't want to wait for that semester, to, that topic to come up as a workshop because it's not till next May. That workshop probably was already held three times before and it's in the archive. So tremendous amount of information there under the Connects workshops. Um, so here are some particular programs, cohort programs that are targeted at different stages of your educational career. So the Innovation Scholars are targeted at under, undergraduate students you apply when you're a sophomore and you get um, into this program for your junior and senior year. Um, there's academic coursework um, to help you uh, get connected to a startup company to work for an internship. Uh, there's mentorship, there's events. Um, James Schwartz Entrepreneurial Fellows Program is similar but targeted at first year graduate students. And by graduate here, I mean typically master's students but also PhD students would be eligible. Um, there's a summer internship program in Silicon Valley or elsewhere, um, weekly cohort meetings, and so on. Um, for this one, there are information sessions coming up on the 12th and 20th. Um, they've already picked the, that's not true. I don't know when the innovation scholars are picked. I, they already have picked for this year, so I think the application might have been in the spring for the undergraduate program. Um, so I'm switching now from, well, how can I transition here? So I'll just dive in without a transition. The i -Corps program, it stands for Innovation Core, and it was started by the National Science Foundation, I'll say a dozen years ago, maybe 15, and National Science Foundation says, you know what, we're putting billions of dollars out every year to academic research. What's dribbling out of the other end that's any good to anybody? Like, we need to fix this. You know, just publishing papers doesn't help our economy, doesn't make us more competitive. <clears throat> so they created this program called i -Core, and the fundamental philosophy of i -Core is get out of the lab and go talk to customers. And there's this whole structured way of teaching how to talk to customers, how to form hypotheses about what your business idea is, how to go test those hypotheses, 
and have a sort of scientific method of figuring out, is your idea a good one? Who, who really wants it? And being able to segment your potential market into like, these people want it, they're extremely excited by it, these people could care less about it, and knowing why. What's different about these people versus these people? And for the ones that do want it, what kind of value do they place on it? Which helps you with your pricing. Like, what's their decision-making process? Like, who has to be involved in the decision? What kind of metrics are they using? So it, it helps you build up your strategy of how you launch a company as a, distinguished from prior to i the approach was, hey, I have a great technology, do you want it? And people would say, yeah, aren't you clever? You have a really nice technology, but yeah, we're not interested. And you'd never really get under the hood and figure out why. This helps you get to the why and form the strategy. So there's a CMU version of this um, called the Customer Discovery Kickstart. Um, this was just created a couple years ago because they restructured the, the, the way the whole national program worked. We no longer had a site. Anyways, so this is targeted primarily for people who can't get into the regional or national program. So undergraduates and master's students typically will do the CMU customer discovery kick, kickstart. <clears throat> um, next session is in October, but you have to attend the intro, you know, why are you here kind of sessions before that. And then CMU is part of multiple universities to participate in a regional hub. It's a three-week program where you do 20 customer discovery interviews. You're being coached on how to do that and giving feedback and so on. The national program is like the Marine Corps. The reason they call it I-Corps is they're bar borrowing from the Marine Corps. They want to break you down as a scientist and build you back up as an entrepreneur. Like, it's seven weeks of hard work to do 100 customer interviews. Can you imagine how many people you need to reach out to to get 100 people to say yes, they'll talk to you? It's a lot. It's, it's, it's grueling. I've gone through it three times as the outside business mentor. Every team comes in with a swagger. Like, yeah, I'm from CMU, I'm from MIT, I did my regional program, I know my shit. A couple of weeks into it, you're like, man, I'm so stupid. Man, why why did I think that? Like, I'm not. Like, by the end of it, everybody's like, I get it now, I get it. I know that these people want it, I know why they want it, I know how much they'll pay for it. Like I'm heading there, or at least you know that they don't want it, and nobody wants it, and you're wasting your time. But like everybody pivots at least somewhat, even if you've come in, yeah, I'm, I'm from CMU, I know my shit. Um, so I highly recommend these programs um, because it helps you figure out what to work on as opposed to just assuming you know what to work on. All right, so moving on from there, CMU has an, its own accelerator program called Venture Bridge. It's targeted at recent alums. I don't know what the time period is. I think it might go out as far as five years, but faculty aren't eligible for this, only alums. So if you're graduating as undergraduate, master's, PhD, you're eligible for this program. It was originally set up to take people to San Francisco for the summer, and then COVID happened. So now it's more virtual. There's things going on in San Francisco and Pittsburgh. They're having their demo day um, this month. They're having three demo days, one in Pittsburgh, one in San Francisco, and one in New York. Sign up and attend the Pittsburgh one. You'll see what, what's going on there. Um, and you get funding there. It's, so I'm sort of transitioning from things without funding, except National i you get $50,000, but it's mostly to pay for travel and go to conferences to do your customer discovery. Venture Bridge, $25,000. McGinnis Venture Competition is specifically for students, um, any level of student, but like faculty can't do this. So there's an undergraduate track, there's a graduate track. Um, the graduate track top prize is $25,000, undergraduate track $4,000. <clears> it happens basically from January to March, I'll say. <clears throat> um, but if you like apply and get registered by December, you get assigned a mentor. You're guaranteed to have a mentor working with you through that process. So again, sign up for the weekly bulletin. You'll find out notices about the McGinnis competition and Venture Bridge Demo Day and all these other things. So another um, cohort type of program that's targeted at PhDs and postdocs. Um, this is the program within the Schwartz Center that works most closely with the Tech Transfer Office because it's focused on situations where CMU owns the IP. 
And going back to the earlier problem I said, is like you have a faculty member not going to give up their day job. The PhD student's really the key. How can we increase their skills, give them some funding so they can get out from under what they need to do on the research grant and like work on commercialization stuff? So this program provides $50,000 on a one-to-one -one matching basis. So the faculty member has to have the other $50,000 to support that PhD or postdoc. And then it's a nine-month program. So it, it's sort of like i -Corps in a sense that you learn how to do the customer discovery. Um, you have an assigned mentor, but it goes beyond i -Corps to like how do you pitch to an investor? How do you set up your financial projections? How do you do your product roadmap? It's like getting you ready to when you graduate as a PhD, you're ready to launch your company. So um, we get maybe... 15 applications for this year, a year, and uh, usually have five. So it helps if you're involved in some of these other programs before you apply for this. All right, so then moving beyond sort of increasing your skills, now like how can you connect with other people that have knowledge? Um, so my title is Mentor in Residence. The Schwartz Center has uh, multiple people who have a title of Entrepreneur in Residence. And that means they are successful entrepreneurs who are either paid a salary or volunteer or paid as consultants to work with all of you on your startup idea. Um, so another resource that we have <clears throat> is called Domain Experts. And this is not people who are on salary or anything or paid as consultants. This is volunteers from the community saying, hey, I'm an expert in immigration law. I'm an expert in accounting. I'm an expert in SBIR grants, whatever. And they have said, I want to help out. How can I get involved? This is the mechanism. They, the commitment they make is to give a free hour advice, free half hour of advice to anybody affiliated from CMU. So you just send them an email and say, hey, I'm from CMU. Can I have half hour of your time to talk about this? And then you schedule with them. Beyond the first half hour, then it sort of depends. But that's, that's the deal. Some of them, like service providers, lawyers, and accountants, and so on, they're doing it because they want to fill their pipeline with potential paying clients for in the future. And if they wait until you're already set up and successful, you, you're already working with somebody else. So they're doing this as sort of helping to create the funnel. Some people are doing this because they want to give back to the community. They've been successful, and they're... Some are just like, this is so exciting. I want to be involved with it. I have a you know, big company position, but I, I want to give back in some way. So check this out. It's sort of buried under the Schwartz Center website under Project Olympus. But if you just search for Schwartz Center domain experts, there's so much expertise there that's available to you for free. So if you don't take advantage of that, you're, you're missing it. I already talked about the entrepreneur matchmaking, the dating service. So some of that's sort of ad hoc. Some of it is through a platform. Uh, in the energy area, <clears throat> there's a program that we're in with NREL, National Renewable Energy Lab, where they have a program with Chevron called Chevron Studio, where they recognize this problem of like, who's the entrepreneur in the room? They will pay an entrepreneur to work with the scientists to develop a go-to-market strategy. So we had a project in their second cohort with uh, uh, Professor Rija Jayan in mechanical engineering. They partnered us with an outside entrepreneur, paid him to work on a go-to-market strategy. He finished that, went back to them, said, hey, here's the strategy. They said, we like it. Here's $275,000 for the next step. So that's a more structured way of running that sort of dating service, in, specifically in the energy area. <clears throat> So swifting, shifting gears here a little bit to talk about um, funding. Um, within our office and within the Manufacturing Futures Initiative, we have what we just call generically gap funds. Like, you're here, you need to get here, here's some funding to do that. It's not a lot of money. We typically do $25,000. Sometimes that can be used to like keep the graduating PhD student around for another six months while you wait for the SBIR grant to come in or something. Or it can be used to hire some outside software developer to turn some research code into something that looks like a product prototype where you can 
show it to a customer. But sometimes we use it as, again, using my, my dating service analogy, we use it as the dowry in the dating game to pay the entrepreneur to work with the scientist on the go-to-market strategy. Um, <clears throat> so it's really flexible money. And yeah, so we have some of it. And um, Manufacturing Futures Initiatives have some of it, but it operates through our office. Um, startup space. So if you're starting a company based on university IP, so it's PhD student, faculty member, we're one of the few universities that will allow a for-profit company to run in your lab. So if you have a million dollars worth of lab equipment and you're getting ready to start out as a startup company and you have a $225,000 grant from NSF that doesn't even allow it to be spent on equipment, you can't get started. You need that equipment. So CMU says, all right, you can run your for-profit company inside the four walls of the nonprofit, sign all these different papers and get insurance and blah, blah, blah. So that's a really unusual thing that, that we do. And we do that in return for additional equity in our licensing deal, not for cash. Both the Schwartz Center for Entrepreneurship over in the Tepper Building and Project Olympus over in Henry Street have startup co-working space. So there's sort of tiers of access. Some of it is you're known to them, you're working with them, they're mentoring you. You can drop in here and work at a table. And you're surrounded by other people doing the same thing. As you sort of move up to pecking order, you're making progress, you get a signed table. As you move up further to pecking order, you get an assigned office. So that's free. Um, and then as you're ready to move out of the university, we have a directory of startup-friendly space in Pittsburgh where they rent small spaces and short-term leases as opposed to you need to sign a five-year lease for 10,000 square feet. <clears throat> um, so getting out of the building, getting out into the community, there are some events at CMU that um, promote this. The launch CMU, Project Olympus Show and Tell. These are when we sort of showcase our, our startup companies. We invite everybody in the community to come. There'll be hundreds and hundreds of people there. It's a great way to network with the community. And we do that uh, with the Scott Institute for Energy Week. It's a week-long event with panel discussions and receptions and a venture fair with companies pitching to investors and the um, often the... Uh, Energy Tech University Prize uh, competition. Um, we've had the, the regionals here. We've had the nationals here. I don't know what's going to correspond with Energy Week this year. We'll see. Um, investor access. So in addition to the Energy Week Venture Fair that we organize, we help to organize the uh, regional AI and robotics venture fair every year. Every 18 months, we do a Three Rivers Venture Fair. Um, I'm personally tapped into over 400 investors. So when you're ready to raise money, we can help you make those connections. Um, and then LinkedIn, I, I'm on LinkedIn every day you know, for my own purposes, as well as helping our startups make connections, um, reach out for customer discovery interviews, and so on. If you're not on LinkedIn, get on LinkedIn and sign up for the weekly bulletin. I'm going to keep saying that. Here we go, sign up for the weekly bulletin. So here's just a quick overview, like in sort of the difference between our office and Schwartz Center. We're very transactional in CTEC. We're managing inventions, we're filing patents, we're negotiating licenses. So like we're crossing I's, dot and T's, and like um, doing transactions. The Schwartz Center is more educational and advisory. So they're putting on events. Um, have programs um, and so on. So we sort of overlap. We're like, we're behind the scenes getting the paperwork done and they're like out doing the education and so on, but we sort of overlap to make some of this stuff happen. So I think that's my last slide and I hope we have lots of questions. Please, thank you. Hey, uh, yeah, thanks again for this presentation. Uh, I'm actually from the MBA program, so it's kind of nice to be on the other side of campus, right? Um, I had a question about some of these startups that you mentioned. What was the kind of time where you started to notice people from the business school, either the, the undergraduate or the MBA program, you know, start to join these teams or start to join, you know, uh, join these ventures and start to actually add value? Because I feel like, typically speaking, 
what the idea is kind of like if it's on the genesis phase, it's all the engineers and it's very tech heavy, right? And you only start to get some business people trickling in after a round of funding. So I just want to kind of, you know, from your experience, where do we fit in? It's a great question. Um, and there's multiple answers. Um, at the earliest stage, um, the scientists typically don't know beans about business. They don't know even what market to approach. So one of the things that MBA students can get involved with is helping do that customer discovery and that market research and so on. So to help them choose a direction. So one example, <clears throat> um, a different battery project, again, coming out of mechanical engineering, Professor Rahul Panad, if any of you work with him, with his 3D printed lattice battery. Um, it's not clear you know, from the perspective of sitting in the lab is like, who wants a very lightweight, um, high energy density battery? So one of the things they did was got involved with uh, the regional i core program, national i core program, we, we found a, the PhD student graduating in the lab in December. It's like, this is too risky. I have two kids. Good luck. So we found a student who is a dual degree uh, master's student in um, chemical engineering as well as ETIM. So engineering technology innovation management. It's in essence MBA for engineers. So he got involved working with an outside entrepreneur met through the NREL matchmaking program. And they collectively have been doing the customer discovery, doing the i -Corps and so on, and sort of narrowing the universe down. Like um, UAVs seems to be the highest value and most pain. Let's go after that first. So they got involved before the company was formed. Um, so he's on the initial cap table as a co-founder. He's working with the CEO. Um, and we could not have moved the, the project forward without him it, because he's bringing both technical skills and business skills. And the outside entrepreneur, like he has business skills, but like he, he can't do like all of the grunt work of like organizing the customer discovery interviews and so on. And he's not gonna get into the lab to like sort of transition stuff out of the lab. So that was very fortuitous that we found this person when the PhD student in the lab couldn't do it. Um, so that's sort of one stage and one type of relationship. Another is uh, people have worked on projects and project courses. If you have an entrepreneurship project course and you need something to work on, like I, I put together a list. I reach out to our project and say, hey, do you want to be considered for a project course? And now there are four in the fall semester in ETAM and six pending at Pitt. I haven't had great luck pitching my list to Tepper in a decade. Back in the day, like there's a feeding frenzy in the fall, and like there'd be a dozen projects being worked on, but then things change for everybody coming into Tepper with an interest in entrepreneurship ha already had their startup idea. They weren't looking for something from our list. So every year I talk to the graduate entrepreneurship clubs, like, yeah, we're going to do things with you in the fall. Like, <laughs> and then next spring, it's like, hey, we have new officers. We'll talk to you again in. Anyway, so they just reached out to me this week. Well, we'll give it another try. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then that's sort of at the pre-founding stage. And then later on, if, say, for example, we have coached up the PhD student through our Innovation Commercialization Fellowship Program, and they've been able to launch the company and maybe get an SBIR grant, and they're de-risking the technology, they sort of personally have to make a career decision. Like, do I want to move back into the lab, say be the chief technology officer, or do I want to like continue in the CEO position? And people do it both ways. So um, uh, Naveed Hazam, who got his PhD in mechanical engineering, Carmel Majidi lab, Majidi's lab. Um, oh, I can't remember Stuart's name. Stuart, 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 Stuart. Stuart also in Carmel's uh, lab started another company, um, Estat. Both of those guys went through Stuart Diller. Both of the, both Stuart and Naveed went through the Innovation Commercialization Fellowship Program, launched their companies, 
and are still functioning as a CEO. So at some point, they're going to need to bring in people who are like director of business development and so on. Um, it's a very long-winded answer to your question, but I, I just want to play out like coming in as sort of co-founder, helping figure out strategy, come in later when like they're sort of sorting out, am I going to be a scientist or a business person or like, all right, we're now up to 15 people we're hiring, you know, head of marketing or whatever. Like there's different stages of getting involved in different roles at those different stages. Anyone else, please? Yes, at the back. Um, I don't have good knowledge about that. There is a separate workshop as part of the Connect series every year. It's almost always the largest attended event of the year in the Connect series. And there's an archive of past workshops on the topic. Um, there is an office at CMU, the Office of International Students or something. You're probably more familiar with it than I am that is very knowledgeable and usually they're on the panel for this workshop along with outside immigration attorneys. I'm not an expert in that and it's, so yeah, we'll direct you to other people. Uh, <laughs> is that, uh, I mean, why are you building a startup? I think one of the important aspect is to find the right co-founder. Right? Uh, I wouldn't know if a small center or the uh, team uh, have any workshops where you could meet uh, from the, from different, uh, yeah. Background. So the first thing I'll say is go to the Entrepreneur Boot Camp this Saturday. The other thing, these Connects workshops are called Connects workshops because at the beginning, anybody can stand up and say, hey, I'm Reed McManigle. I'm getting a PhD in computer science. I'm looking for an MBA co-founder. I'm looking for somebody to do back-end development. Whatever it is that you want, they're called Connects because it's an opportunity to connect. And go to, go to all these events. Go to the Venture Bridge Demo Day and like start talking to people. And people will remember what you're doing and say, oh, yeah, I met this person over here. That, let me introduce you. So the more you're out networking, the more people are going to know what you're doing and can make connections for you. So business, uh, you look at research. Uh, anybody in business So So one of the front doors to our office is the licensing managers like Jake. So it depends what school and department you're in, like which licensing manager you work with. Computer science. Uh, we, because that's so big, we actually break it into different licensing managers. But anyways, on our, on our website, there's like an assignment um, listing of which licensing managers work with which schools and departments. Um, so that, in a sense, will bring you in the door thinking about an invention, invention disclosure, patenting, and things like that. And then if you say, hey, I'm thinking about a startup, the licensing manager pulls me in. But if you want to talk strategy, you know, anytime before that, we could do that. Lock the doors. Nobody gets out till we have five more questions. <laughs> yeah, any other questions from the audience? I mean, I thought that last question was actually a really good question, which is, you know, if anyone in this room has an idea or a potentially marketable you know, uh, intellectual property, they want to file for a patent, like, what is the, like, the, the first step that they should do? So the front doors of CTEC. Uh, like, what is the email address that they should email and say, here is my problem, and that, that, that request will be directed to the right person? Innovation at cmu.edu. And a lot of information is on our website, like the, the assignments of the licensing managers, you know, how to submit an invention disclosure, things like that. Um, so if, you, if you're thinking about inventions and it's coming out of research, CTEC is a good starting point. If you're doing things that aren't based on funded research, the Schwartz Center is your starting point. And we'll refer back and forth as the situation warrants. Uh, thank you for the presentation. How does it take usually to, to file a patent and what's the journey like? 
Um, great question. So when we start the patenting process, typically what we do as a first step is file what's called a provisional patent application. And a provisional patent application is a one-year placeholder. If you don't follow up with a full patent application, the provisional just disappears into the ether. So a provisional patent application marks the date. And you go in later, file a full application based on the provisional. You still keep the filing date of the provisional. Um, if you follow up the full application within that year, you can file either an application just in the US or you can file what's called a PCT, Patent Cooperation Treaty filing, which is now a placeholder at the international level. And then later, if you file a PCT, you have to decide 18 months after that, which individual countries am I filing this patent in? Because that was just a placeholder. So our institutional policy is, we'll keep this train going until we get to that nationalization stage by doing whatever we can to keep all options open. But when we get to that point, it just gets too expensive to file in a bunch of different countries. So our approach is we won't file outside the US. We won't nationalize outside the US unless we have somebody ready to pay for it. So that window of time from provisional till national deadline, nationalization deadline is 30 months. Once you file, it sits in a patent office someplace, maybe for two years. Then finally they pick it up and they say, hmm, I'll do a search. I found this word, I found this word. These words are in your application. Somebody already invented this. All claims rejected, go away. And then you like battle back and forth and multiple times. Each time you go back and forth, now you're working with a lawyer. You're spending maybe $5,000, maybe six months, nine months of fighting. You get to the final, like, yes, we're getting a patent on these part of the, the claims. So if it's university owned IP, the university's managing all this. If it's your IP, it's on you. So to get to an issued patent, just in the US, maybe it's $25,000 on a low end. But you know, individual situations can vary. And like you're battling with the patent examiner for two years and you spend $100,000 and you end up not getting a patent. It's like you're putting money into this poker game over and over and over. You don't know how good your cards are. And then it gets rejected, you're out, all that money. So if it's university owned IP, we're doing that. We're taking the risk. We get it back if we do a license. If we don't get it back, it's a cost that our office eats. If you're doing this personally, you need to be watching your nickels and be very strategic about it. I mean, we're very strategic in watching our nickels too. Um, but yeah, if you're doing this on your own, you want to file a provisional patent application, and that gives you one year's time. And then you can go out and talk to people. Once you've filed something, you can breathe a little easier about talking about it. Before you file, if you're out talking about it and presenting on it, you're losing rights. If you give public disclosure of enabling details prior to filing, the rest of the world besides the United States says, this is in the public domain. You can't file a patent now. US has a one year grace period after that public disclosure. So if you're sending your manuscript off to a journal for a review, send us an invention disclosure. You get your publication date from the journal, tell us we'll file a provisional that day. So we want to keep it step. Don't contact us the day the publication's coming out or the publication came out last week at the conference and like people were mobbing me and say, wow, this is really exciting. And then you come to us, we've already lost the ability to patent outside the US. So do those in parallel. So uh, great follow up. So I guess your recommendation would be before talking to any customer, or venture customer, you should file an original uh, patent application for it. So typically, customers don't want confidential information. You don't want to give them confidential information up front. Investors don't want confidential information. You start that dialogue by having a way of talking about what you're doing without describing the secret sauce. So don't, don't disclose enabling details, the how of what you're doing. Say, here's the problem we're approaching. We've done some magic things. Here's the results we're getting. Are you interested in talking? And then you could talk about it in ways that don't describe the secret sauce, and you're okay. And then if they say, yeah, we're really interested in this, 
but we need to understand the secret sauce, then you ha have them sign a confidentiality agreement. And it's still not a public disclosure, then it's a private disclosure. But if you're like doing an abstract at a conference, or paper, presentation, whatever, and it has enabling details, you're crossing that line. So that's when you would want to have to file your provisional before that. Yeah, so I'm a master's student in the College of Engineering. So I, as a master's student, I don't have the uh, time and space for me to do a complete research in any data system, but unlike what our PhD student has, in terms of a deep tech in, in this lab research. So is there a common resource where I can deploy to some, lab, some, some of the labs or some of the places and so looking for partners for the more uh, deep tech stuff? Because for MBA, I decided it's more to some side. Yeah. There's not any sort of central thing that I can think of other than I had this master list of the things that are already startups or that we're actively working with that are startups. Um, I, I think maybe the best thing to do is talk to the professors in your department. You know, hey, I hear you have a startup or what startups are happening in our department and like nose around in your department. Please join me in thanking Reed for all right. Thank you.